All right, are we ready? Yeah. All right, last session of the day. So good afternoon. I am Carrie Howitt. I'm the public defender for Palm Beach County. And I have the great pleasure of facilitating this panel on reentry. Um, I have a sort of special heart for reentry. Um, obviously, in my job, we see too often the revolving door. And in a desire to sort of address those issues, I've talked to so many clients who never wanted to go back to prison, right? But it happened. And so much of it is because of the lack of services and the lack of continuity and release plans and all of that. So we were fortunate in Palm Beach County to start a reentry um, task force about 15 years ago, uh, partnered with DOC to get a reentry facility in our county for people who are returning to Palm Beach County. And um, it has, and really, it's really a community program engaging community partners with services. Um, and I think as we're gonna hear from many of the panelists and their programs, these programs work. If we decide that the definition of success is both public safety and quality of life, we're seeing it over and over again with substantially reduced recidivism rates, families reunited, people getting healthy starts. And so, um, I was, uh, felt very privileged to be able to facilitate this panel because I think you're going to hear about some wonderful reentry initiatives, ideas, and then we're going to push it a little bit to talk about what do we want in that ideal world. So let me just introduce our panelists to you first. Um, first, we have Senator Rusan. Um, Senator Rusan was for five years the head of the NAACP. He then went on to be elected to the House of Representatives where he served eight years. And he is halfway through his first term um, in the Florida Senate. Senator Rusan, I know, has been involved in um, reentry issues, reentry programs. It is something that is a special interest and concern of his. So I look forward to hearing from him. Um, our next panelist is Tina Pate. Tina, um, is um, she has her own business, but she's really been an advocate for um, victims of crime and has advocated for victim rights. So I think that is an important aspect when we talk about reentry, right, and reconciliation. Uh, she was on uh, what is now called the Florida Commission of Offender Review, what many of us know as uh, the parole board, for a number of years and has been working with various governors, um, worked as the Florida Rights um, Victims Rights Coordinator, had, works on various national and, safety, and state safety boards, um, and was a member of the Florida Innocence Commission and um, the Attorney General's Domestic Violence Fatality Review Team. Uh, she, in her business, Tina Payton Associates, provides consulting and advocacy services in criminal justi justice matters to include parole, clemency, reentry, and other victim and offender-related issues. So thanks for being here, Ms. Pate. Let's see. Next, we have um, Judge Elizabeth Jenkins. I liked this with her, how she termed, she's on recall to the Middle District um, as a magistrate. She served over 30 years as a magistrate in the Tampa Division of the Middle District of Florida, and I guess they recalled her. Is that what they call it? it it's, it's voluntary. It requires both my consent and the consent gotcha. of the Gotcha. Okay. It's, it's a way to transition from active service to full-time, put on the brakes, stop. Got it. I wasn't ready to put on the brakes. Thank you. Well, I'm, um, Judge Jenkins has described her service as a judge on the reentry court as transformative. Um, and I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, so they have a reentry court in federal court, and she has served as the judge in that court. So we'll have a chance to think, talk more about that. Before taking the bench, she was an assistant U.S. attorney for eight years. Next, we have John, right? I'm looking here. 
John Kufos. Um, so he is um, the National Directory of Reentry Initiatives um, in, at Right on Crime um, and the Executive Director of the Safe Streets and Second Chance Project. Uh, John helped build the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, um, and Governor Christie really made this a, an important part um, of his initiatives. Um, so John helped him and five former governors to implement effective evidence-based reentry services. Um, now uh, there are 60 employees in nine program sites, um, and it has become a nationally recognized legal program combining technology and staff lawyers with approximately 70 pro bono lawyers to help the reentry community clear old tickets and warrants and restore driver's licenses that lead to jobs. So um, John is a was a lawyer and um, has, and so really used, I think, his knowledge both as a lawyer um, and as a, um, we'll call him consumer of the, of services and has put together some really fascinating cutting edge um, stuff that has uh, made a difference and utilized the legal community in his area. And then we have, I'm sorry, I have it right here, supposedly. This a man that needs no introduction. A man that needs no introduction. Trying to buy you some time there. But thank you. Keep <laughs> buying it because I oh I have it right here on the same paper. Drum roll, please. I had to shorten it. It took me so long to shorten it. I knew I wouldn't lose it. Um, so we have Kevin Gay. He is the founder and CEO of Operation New Hope, um, formerly of Corporate America. He left Corporate America in 1999 to devote his energies. Um, to revitalizing urban communities and help underserved, the underserved in communities who seek a way out of the cycle of poverty and incarceration. Um, so he combined homes needing restoration in urban areas with people who needed skills training and jobs. Um, he has recognized and worked with four um, presidents on reentry issues. He developed the first national model for reentry, and um, I think there are now what's um, how many communities have ready for work is the name of the of the um, program, and it's 16 cities at this point. Is that right, Kevin? It, well, it was rolled out in 2003 in Jacksonville, and then they rolled it into 16 cities. Okay. Thank you. And um, earlier, you you may not have heard Senator Bradley talking about your program um, and was very complimentary about it being really a model of what we should be looking at. So sorry about mixing up the order. I couldn't see. I, when I put on these stupid glasses, I can read, but I can't see. So I thought we'd just start out this conversation with um, just each person taking a few minutes to describe your involvement with reentry programs or policy um, to educate the folks about what you all do. So jump in. Do we start with the senator now? I thought we'd start with you. Ah. There we go, John. You're the boss. <laughs> thank you, Senator, and thank you all for, for having me. Uh, I'm John Kufos. Uh, I, I know I have a very distinct Southern accent. Uh, you probably think I'm from Florida originally. Nope, I'm from, uh, from New Jersey, uh, now living in, uh, in Washington, D.C. as the National Director of Reentry Initiatives for Right on Crime. Um, my start in this field um, was probably like many of yours in the sense that you know, I, I spent a decade trying racketeering and murder cases uh, all across New Jersey. There's plenty of them in New Jersey, so it's like anybody can do them. Uh, you, know, you know, specialized trainings have to exist in the state. Um, so I spent uh, about a decade doing that. Um, and you know, I, I, I'll take you back to January of 2012. So I'm arguing my first case before the New Jersey Supreme Court. It is a, uh, it's the, you know, the, the largest search and seizure case in years, community caretaking, emergency aid, all wrapped into one. 
uh, as, it so, as it often is. And I'm arguing this case, and I'm standing before the Jersey Supreme Court, and all I could think of was that I was out on $150,000 bail. So I was 33, I think, at the time. And uh, I, I would go on to win that case, but like anyone who's arguing for the Supreme Court, you don't get a decision that day. When I got the decision, I was in prison. Um, a few months before that, I was driving drunk, and I hit someone, nearly killed them. Uh, and I tried to lie my way out of it. Uh, ended a 20-year battle with alcoholism. Uh, and for that, I deservedly went to prison. Um, sentenced to six years. Uh, we have a parole system in New Jersey. I was blessed to be paroled after 17 months. Uh, along the way, I would you know, uh, lose everything that I had worked for. Again, forfeited based on my conduct, let me be clear. Um, and I end up in a place, because I'm from the Shore area, which is nicer than the MTV show, I promise. You know, Jersey Shore, some of the guys are like that, but those are New York guys coming to our area. Um, but I end up moving to Hoboken, New Jersey. And any, anyone know Hoboken, New Jersey? All right, one, two. So you all know it's not a place where drunks go to get sober, right? It's like, it's like the most partying town in the whole state. So here I am, released from prison, on parole, an incredibly high-profile inmate and gang lawyer, uh, and I'm now surrounded by bars. But wherever there's a lot of drunks, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good sobriety. So how did I get into reentry? Well, I'm sitting in the prison law library at Bayside State Prison, and I was only there because it was one of the two air-conditioned spots on the whole, in the whole, in the whole joint. And uh, I'm reading my New York Times, because that won't get stolen by the COs, right? You get a saltwater sportsman, it's gone. But if you, uh, if you were New York Times, the Atlantic, they don't want any piece of it. Um, must be too blue. So in, in any event, there uh, are too many big words. Oh, I know we're being recorded. That's all right, though. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, just trying to keep it loose. So in any event, I'd watch guys go out to the halfway house and be sent right back, right? And they'd be sent back for old fines, old fees, old warrants. Uh, my work as lead counsel to the NAACP told me that you know there was this was no accident um, that uh, and that these laws were discriminatory on their face they had a discriminatory result etc. So I get out and I read about a former governor in New Jersey doing a prison ministry thing, and I said, listen, I'm not I don't need reentry. I was blessed. I had employment when I got out, um, but I can solve with my old drinking buddies, now I'm sober, but it, so I can solve this fines and fees issue. So they said, well, how are you gonna do that? I said, well, I'm gonna get everybody to file motions to convert fines to jail time and to forgive fines. So anyway, I volunteered for a few months. Uh, this was Jim McGreevy, who, uh, who's up in Jersey, uh, and he took me to see Governor Christie uh, and his administration. I was on parole, so I definitely didn't wanna see Governor Christie. And then the parole chair was there, so I certainly didn't want to see him at all. Send me back, he didn't like the color of my tie. The commissioner of corrections was there, my jailer, so I'm like having PTSD at all. And the attorney general was there. So it's like the worst group of people that could ever be in one room. But it turned out to be the most important thing that ever happened to me. Uh, as a result of our conversation, I was asked to design the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, and I hyper focused on what I knew best, which was law. Uh, to that end, I utilized a, a cloud-based case management system and linked 70 pro bono lawyers across the state. Uh, all 21 counties, uh, we had coverage. So if a guy got out and came to the New Jersey, New Jersey Reentry Corporation, had old fines and fees in some corner of the state where we didn't cover, we still had coverage, at least legal coverage there. As a result of that, we, in the three years, I was the executive director of the New Jersey Reentry Corporation uh, before I gave it uh, back to the to the governors, we restored over 400 driver's licenses, right, and forgave six figures of fees easily. Now, what was the operational result of that? Union apprentices, union union apprenticeships, and real jobs, right? We had felon classes. And I guess I guess that's my word, right? Because I'm one of them. I, could, I think you have to call me a returning citizen, I think. Although it's Florida. I'm lucky I'm even in the room, right? But um, the, uh, we were putting classes of returning citizens, overwhelmingly minorities in New Jersey, into the building trades. These guys were going from never having a driver's license uh, to now having a fully clear driver's license and being a union apprentice. 
straight to the middle class or better. So we started there. The program's deeper than that, but since we're at a bar association event, um, I've, I'll leave it to the legal piece. Right now, we're operating a Safe Street Second Chances project, which is operating, I think, at 11 of your prisons in Florida. And our releases are coming back to, to Kevin's backyard in Jacksonville. Um, and I intend to build a similar network of lawyers there and in the other four states that I work in right now. And then the other five we're doing next year and the five after that. So that's a conversation, an extended conversation I expect to have with many of you about how to operationalize that. So hopefully I didn't go over time, no. but thank you. Well, good afternoon. Hope everybody's still awake. Well, you have to be awake after uh, hearing John speak. And uh, John, thank you for the great work that you're doing too. And, uh, um, and thank all of you. I wanna say just real quickly to the Florida Bar uh, a big thank you to um, Hank and to Michelle and, and everybody that's been involved in this. The, the conversations have been dynamic. Some conversations are really dynamic if you've been in some of the rooms, but that's where we need to go and move uh, to get some resolution. Um, you know, John and I were asked to maybe tee up a little bit of how we got involved in the program. So I'll just you know briefly for the next 45 minutes uh, talk about. I'm just kidding. Um, how I got involved, but I think our stories are I think are interesting because I think for for me and the work that we do in reentry, how we're, the work that we do today was really built upon organically how we started. And it, back in 1999, I left corporate America. I've been on the board of the, one of the largest Habitat affiliates in the United States is in Jacksonville, and was just really enamored by the work that uh, that Habitat affiliates do around the country, engaging communities and teaching people and you know, bringing people in and the outcomes of you know folks having housing is, is a great one but what i ended up seeing in the years of doing that uh, was there were a lot of young folks i called on the sidelines looking out at us doing you know work in rebuilding communities and, and kind of going this is a different dichotomy why are we not engaging those folks in and so in 1999 i asked my dad and his partner if i could do what i thought was going to be a three to six month sabbatical that was 20 years ago now um, and look at developing a community development concept with the idea of building housing, but also looking to try to engage more into the community. Had no idea about the issues around reentry, uh, but I had to learn the hard way. Um, a few of you may have heard me tell the story, but I think it's telling because it really changed me personally. Um, we were working and building houses in our urban community and we couldn't keep a contractor on. Literally, it was like clockwork for you know, two or three months. They would come to me and say, I've had it. These folks have stolen our tools over and over again. And so I went to uh, this organization, o Ocala, and had a customized trailer built. Spent about $45,000 on it. It had these little compartments in it. And I told the contractors, you'll never have to worry about your tools again. What do you think happened a couple weeks later? Stole the whole trailer. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the journey of, you know, knowing that I had a long way to go. But, I, you know, a couple weeks later, a wonderful urban pastor came and put his arm around me and he said, are you ready to listen? I said, I'm all ears. If you would start hiring right around where you're building, you'll be pleasantly surprised at what could happen. And I had no idea what he was talking about. As a matter of fact, I was probably a deer in the headlights, but I was willing to try anything. And we did. And there was two young men that were living in an abandoned house across from where we were working. And we went to visit. Um, of course, I, he was a big guy. I was behind him like this as we went in. Um, and we said to these young men, I said, look, if you will come every morning at 730, we'll train you, we'll work with you and, and give you a job. And what began from that process was really something um, for me personally. Um, you know, from a distance, and I'm just, I, I do this, I have to do this everywhere I go, 25 years ago, we talk about what is our problem with the criminal justice system. 25 years ago, it was me. You know, 25 years ago, I assumed a lot of things about a lot of people. It was interesting. We had just went through that luncheon on implicit and explicit bias. And I assumed a lot that a certain group of people didn't want to work, didn't want to take care of the kids, didn't want to be engaged in the community, didn't want to be successful like me. And, and how wrong I was. And these two young men started that journey for me. Um, every morning, and they were living in an abandoned house. They had been their own crack, and I mean, you can imagine the conditions. But in light of all that, they showed up every morning at 7:30, and our whole 
our, every, our, our staff, organization, the board, all fell in love with these folks, and they ended up teaching us way more than we, we taught them. But here's what was pa powerful. Not a nail was stolen from our jobs from that day forward going on. And it really imparted in my heart and my spirit the power of a job. And so quickly, I, we started a nonprofit construction company because I said, look, I want to be able to control our destiny because trust me, while it's much easier today to get folks jobs, 20 years ago, Tina, when we were on some, I think we're on our 14th Secretary of the Department of Corrections now in Florida, but on advisory councils and a lot, of, a lot of the conversations was around employment. It was hard. It was like pushing a rock up the hill. And but so we could control our own destiny when we had a construction company, which we did for a number of years. And then in 2003, President Bush got wind of what we were doing. I wanted to study the impact that employment has on reducing incarceration. And so we began the journey. And as John probably knows, and those of you who have been around in this, um, early on in reentry, the work in reentry was more, I hate to use the word triage, but it was really not sophisticated. It was really a lot of great intention, um, a lot of faith-based organizations, you know, folks like me that had good intention but not enough skills and knowledge to, to really be as effective as we could. Um, and we were really trying to get folks back in as quick as we could, just like I use the term triage in, in the battle. But what we, I, what we began to learn over, the, over that period of time was, and I believe this with all my heart, we can, we'll get into conversations about data and statistics because it's really important to measure and, and to evaluate in, in the systems that we need. But it's important that we all come to understand the power that poverty has in this conversation. I mean, the data is clear. Those who came, the majority of the folks that come in, into the system are coming from poverty, and then those that leave end up in worse poverty and, and, and never can regain. And so when we began to look at that model of, of, of the poverty issue, it became incumbent for me in the epiphany that we had was, well, then who is your real customer? Who is your real customer? And that was hard for me. I came from corporate America. I'm not a social, social service provider. And so for me, I had to ask that question. And when we really realized that if we really believe that poverty is the issue, we needed to treat our employers, the few that we had at the time, as our customer, meaning that they had to understand and feel that we were really there to serve them. We wanted to find out what their needs were and that we would work hard at going out and finding those folks that would meet their needs as employers. And I think once we began that shift, and really what that then told us was, and I know this is probably going to sound a bit crass, but our clients really became our product line. Like any company, any person who invents anything, they, became, they become very proud of the product they create and, and the work that they do, but you have to be able to get that product to market and get it marketable. And so what we learned, and, and I'll never forget this, uh, about 15 years ago, we did a big focus group with top CEOs in Jacksonville. We had a facilitator that asked the CEOs, would you guys be, and they're using some terms I don't like, would you guys be willing to hire ex-cons on your job? And they did that for a reason, to try to really kind of get some honesty going here. And the response was they all started laughing. And then the facilitator said, I guess we'll take that as a hell no. And they said, yeah, we're not going to hire folks with records. And I'll never forget, it started with one, uh, with one man. Actually, his last name is Gay, too, W.W. Gay, who's a big contractor in our, in our city. He said, you know, if you can bring me somebody who can be on time, I'd probably consider it. And then you saw the next guy going around the table. Well, if you could find somebody who could pass a drug test, this guy had a good attitude, and it just began to morph around the room. And at the end, I asked a question. If we can bring that person to you, would you be willing to hire? And every single one of them raised their hand and said we would. And so what we've learned in the process in this work is that it's really about how we can change the narrative. I love Brian Stevenson. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read a book that he's called Just Mercy. It's incredible. But he talks about the proximity shift that allows us to then change the narrative. And as I said earlier on, as, as John probably had some similar conversations, but being a lawyer involved in this, he probably was more aware. I had no idea what our country had created in this monster we have in our criminal justice system and how broken it is. Um, but I am very, very excited about what's happening in our own community uh, and how that shift can begin to move. 
Um, in 2008, um, I was a part of it with our city council in writing, I think, one of the first, if not the first, legislation on Ban the Box because we tried to get our chamber involved in hiring, but our city had a prohibition from hiring folks from government. So it was hard to go to, to our chamber and to corporate America to engage, um, but we did, and, and, and it passed unanimously in, in the end of 2007. Two years ago, our chamber became, in a very conservative chamber, became uh, one of the first chambers in America to do the same. It's called Project Open Door. You can look at it online, projectopendoor.org. Um, so, so incredible, and if those of you who've had a chance to meet Melissa Nelson in our, in our community, we have got some great assets, our judiciary, a public defender, and the state attorney who are now on the same page. So the work that we do, though, and I'll, and I'll close, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great science around this work today that us and other practitioners around the country are doing and really helping to get our hands around what our folks are dealing with. The moment folks are released, it's imperative that we understand the needs that they face. Um, and so there are great assessment tools that we've been involved in. I, I think back in uh, 2000 or 1999, 2000, we developed one with the University of North Florida. It was really I came from the insurance world, and when I saw how complicated, I've seen this conversation here the last day and a half with, with sheriff's office, with judges and others, talk, talking about where the burden ends up and who has responsibility for letting somebody out if they could, you know, commit another crime. And so, but we're further along in that today. We've developed the, the tools and the assets today that allow us to really get our hands around who's there. For me, the starting point was, and I said this to our staff back, you know, 2003 or four, I want to underwrite everybody that walks in our door. And from my world in the insurance world is trying to get our hands around what are the risks that each person coming in would have to going back into using drugs or going back out on the street, which led to us developing an assessment tool, and then developing an individualized plan of care that we use. Um, and today, I'm excited to say that as a number of performing uh, reentry providers, our, re our recidivism rate has consistently been about 50% less than the state, federal, and, and local numbers. Whether you're looking at, everybody defines reentry, or excuse me, recidivism differently as a rearrest or reconviction, but either way you do it, there is no question that the services that, um, that these folks need, once they have it in a clear path, it's a game changer. And so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I appreciate having the opportunity to share. Thank you. Um, already in the past 10 minutes, I've made notes on a couple of things that I want to go back and look at. And uh, one of the delights of being where I am in my life right now, my career, is I am, I am uh, still learning. I'm still growing. I'm, I'm still wanting to stay in the game. And I, I use the word transformational. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. For reentry court, because it truly has been transformational for me. Uh, for Judge Jim Whittemore, um, a U.S. District Judge, for Judge uh, uh, Anthony Porcelli, a U.S. Magistrate Judge like myself, and now we have Judge Mary Scriven, who's joined the reentry team in Tampa. And I know my colleagues across the Middle District, which stretches from Jacksonville across the state to Naples, um, where there are also reentry programs. The first one was in Jacksonville, and of course, Kevin is very familiar with that. Uh, there was a second in Orlando, and then Tampa. Our reentry program started in May of 2011. Uh, when I went for training in Washington, D.C. on reentry in 2010, about one third of the federal courts uh, had reentry programs of some type. I, I believe to this day that it's probably grown, but I don't have any recent data. Uh, we in federal court owe a large debt to the state courts, which of course have been innovative far earlier than the federal courts in matters regarding the drug court, which I understand typically works pre-conviction, and then the own re-entry model. So we, we are tremendously grateful. Um, those at the Federal Judicial Center who do the studies and send out the booklets and the, prepare the PowerPoints and, you know, rest to a large extent, I think, on some of the re research and data. Now, when I was a federal prosecutor in the late 70s, early 80s, there were no sentencing guidelines in federal court. Uh, fast forward to the 80s and then the 90s where the mandatory sentences, the sentencing guidelines, which were very complex, and, and other matters um, really made sentencing um, 
I don't want to say a perfunctory process because everyone I know who sentences takes it very, very seriously, but the discretion of the court certainly was, was limited. We have to remember that um, sentences serve three purposes. They punish, they deter, but they also rehabilitate. And, and we know that the rehabilitation part, of course, in, in prison, perhaps an individual can get his or her GED, perhaps they can get some training, they certainly are gonna be sober in most cases and, and drug free, but um, we no longer have parole in federal court, we have what's called supervised release. And an individual can be ordered to uh, SR for several years to as much as 10 and, and, and beyond that. There are some people who are on um, life supervised release where you have to comply with all conditions set by the court, et cetera, et cetera, and the court retains the jurisdiction to revoke your sentence. Well, um, the federal reentry model, much as, as your models, um, is based on those individuals who are at the highest risk of recidivism. The expert tell us that you don't want to over, over supervise people who are at low risk because it can backfire. So um, we drafted off a, a number of other models, including those in Jacksonville and Orlando, um, and it is the decision of the probation officer initially to identify those individuals at the highest risk of recidivism. And in our court, um, the federal probation officers will identify those individuals coming out of the Bureau of Prisons who may qualify. They administer to them, and they also score something called the post-conviction risk assessment test, or PICRA, which um, assesses four risk factors, cognition, social network, drug alcohol, and education employment. Um, these individuals who score moderately to high on the PICRA are actually told by the probation officer who's going to be supervising them once they're on supervised release, look, you score moderate to high. Um, these are your scores. We, we, think, you know, we think you're really at risk because of these various things in your background. Uh, so the individuals who fit those criteria are given an opportunity an opportunity because they have to volunteer to join the intensive reentry program. Um, they, they have to agree and also the supervising judge has to agree for them to go into the program. Um, there are some people who don't want anything to do with it. There are some people who start the program and decide this is too much trouble, I'm coming to court. But by and large, most of those who are offered the opportunity do participate. Now, I want to pause for just a minute. You in state court have tremendously high volume. You, you have issues that we, uh, you know, are just um, in awe at in terms of, of the challenge that, that you have in reintegrating people into the community. Because we generally have just one, maybe two probation officers, we have a fairly small, small population to draw some from. So we are, we are giving the highest priority individuals the opportunity to participate. Um, there is also an agreement that the individual signs, you know, on, as far as the criteria, which are not a whole lot different from traditional supervised release, but, but, but it's enhanced. It is, it is harder in, in many ways. The carrot is that once uh, a person successfully completes reentry, which takes about a year, and all the requirements, which I'll discuss in a minute, that individual um, has one year uh, removed from their supervised release. Now, judges do have the discretion to reduce supervised release generally, but it usually doesn't happen. But, th but this program, there's the authority already built into the federal system to allow the judge to reduce one year of supervised release. The individuals um, typically have anywhere from six months to maybe a few more years to complete on their ordinary supervised release program. So once released from a halfway house, and I realize that the resources for halfway houses in state court are very, very different from federal court, but most people go to a halfway house. Remember, some of the sentences that they are serving may be eight to 10 years to 15 to 25, and maybe there's been some reduction for various initiatives that have come through uh, nationally, but um, they are coming off long prison sentences. They go to a halfway house, they have to get a job, they have to be drug tested, and then once they're released from halfway house, they start in our program. The key aspects of the reentry program are the four phases of progressively uh, increased independence, hopefully, and accountability. Um, a total of 48 credits is required for completion. 
you don't need those numbers, but basically it takes about a year to complete. Um, a mandatory part is regular appearance at court sessions. Uh, for phase one and phase two, they have to come to court every two weeks. For phase um, three and four, uh, they have to come to court once a month. Now, what does coming to court mean? Coming to court usually is extremely painful for these individuals. You don't go to court unless you're in trouble. Criminal proceedings are adversarial. Uh, th there is conflict. Um, we put these individuals in, in the jury box. They sit in the jury box. They do come in a courtroom. They're usually about eight to ten at any one time. You might have someone who is just starting, just getting out of halfway house, and someone who's been in our program for one year together, and there's an advantage to that, which I'll talk about it later, because the ones who have been through it a few months can say, you know, it isn't so bad, and these people are really supportive, and, and you know, guess what? It's not what you, what, not what you might think. Um, there's also drug testing, which is required from regular supervised release. There is cognitive behavioral counseling, and those of you in the audience know a lot more about that perhaps than I do, but it's called CBT training to deal with the criminal thinking that has made them career offenders or repeat offenders at high risk of recidivism. There's regular contact with the reentry probation office and members of the reentry team. And by the way, the probation officers are volunteers, the prosecutors are volunteers, the public defenders are volunteers. So we're all volunteers, all of us. The judges are volunteers. So we have that bond that we're there at those court sessions because we want to be there. We want to be there. And there has to be progress in completing short and long-term goals in areas of employment, training, residential, and family stability. So at the court sessions, we will have these individuals in the jury box. It's Mr. Jones or it's Ms. Smith or whoever they are. They're not defendants, they're participants. Occasionally we, we slip up, but, but the judge, there are three of us who are judges, and I was a judge for five years until I retired. Now I help out as needed and I go to the graduations, which are just wonderful. Um, and individuals are given the opportunity, well, they're asked, you know, how's your week been or how's your month been? And there is a sheet that they get before they go in and the judges and the other mem members of the reentry team get, which shows their progress in meeting various goals. And um, we discuss that with them. There, are, there is the incentive, of course, of getting a year off supervised release, but I think there is an incentive in getting positive reinforcement. I always tell the individuals when I meet them for the first time, the first thing I look at in your PSR, your pre-sentence report, is not your record, not your drug history. I look at when your birthday is, because if it's anywhere near your birthday when you're in court, I want to tell you happy birthday. Now, is that Pollyannish? Maybe, but you know, I, it's important to me, all right? It's your first birthday, you were with your family, you had a chance to see that son that you haven't seen for 10 years. So, um, but we are difficult, we, we do hold them accountable. Uh, there is sternness, there are sanctions that are available to us. If somebody tests positive, they don't bounce out of the program the first time, it's, it's really a sliding scale. Uh, they'll have stepped up uh, drug testing, et cetera, things like that. Truthfulness, is a premium. We say, like you say with your kids, you know, if, uh, if I'm the first one you tell, it's going to be easier on you than I'm the last one to find out. The criminal thinking, of course, is not accepting responsibility, and, and so the counseling will help with that, but we'll tell them, you know, you're, you're going to take a step back, you know, you're going to screw up. Um, keep coming to court, tell your probation officer, we'll work with you, we'll, we'll do whatever we can. To, to assist you. So just, just a, one comment about, um, I'll have a chance to talk later, but I was thinking this morning about, you know, some of the wonderful stories that we've heard. And I remember one guy uh, who had gotten a job at the port, and he said at the end of a long day, and they all come in in their, you know, work clothes, and the employers are supportive because they know this is an intensive program and they're going to be watched. And he said, so I get to my car, and for, he left it unlocked for some reason. I don't know, maybe it couldn't lock me. He said, and there's a guy asleep in the driver's seat. He said, the old me would have ripped open the door, dragged him out, and beat the you-know-what out of him. He said, but, he said, I just laughed. And I thought, that could have been me. Now, those are the stories that keep us going. Those are the stories that, that made me stay on for five years and make me coming back because it changes the dynamic. We relate to each other as, as siblings, as parents, as children, 
uh, and as one veteran for, former prosecutor did, and we all just about died when she said it because she is really, really very, very hard edged, very aggressive. She said, I want you to be part of the community that I'm trying to protect. So it, it gives us all hope for the future. It changes the dynamic. We are all part of the same community. We are building a community. And I am very, very positive about what it offers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kate. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor being a part of this today and just already listening to uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I applaud you for the work that you have done and it's very inspirational. I do want to make a comment to Senator Rousson just to thank him publicly for all of the assistance he gave me when I was at the commission and you uh, assisted us with getting funding and um, carrying the water many times on some of our initiatives. So I wanted to thank you publicly for that. So, you know, we're all speaking to you about our perceptions and our experiences with the topic of offender reentry. And I'm going to talk about mine from primarily being at the commission, serving as a commissioner as well as the agency head. Also, my work in crime victims issues. And what I can tell you is my thinking has evolved. Um, I am one of those that many of us in the system, we've always been very conscious on public safety, but we've limited the definition of public safety to only the prosecution and holding offenders accountable. We haven't looked at it on the, the part of if we haven't prepared these offenders for release, then that's not doing anything to ensure public safety. We have the... Um, huge problem with creating further victims and again endangering society because these offenders are not ready to come out. One of the things that was unique about the Parole Commission is we had um, a different population of offenders that we were in charge of. Of course we had the parole population which had decreased down to about 4,500 inmates by the time I left that was a discretionary release program and we reviewed those cases our first time ever seeing those offenders was when they were within six to eighteen months of serving their 25 year minimum mandatory so they had been in a while very experienced quite accustomed to living inside of an institution we also had responsibility over some mandatory release programs, and that was um, the conditional release offender population, as well as addiction recovery. We also administered the conditional medical release program for those offenders who um, was having a health crisis and were not expected to live. We had to make decisions about those as well. And then, of course, we had the clemency responsibility that um, we did the investigations for the governor and the cabinet. What is unique about the discretionary and the mandatory supervision populations is we had an opportunity to absolutely influence the success of offenders that were the parole eligible offenders. We had, um, like the judge mentioned, the carrot and stick approach. We could use that with the parole eligible offenders before they would come up for review. We could make recommendations the previous time we had seen those cases and then have an expectation of how they would have complied with those recommendations. You don't have that with a mandatory release population of offenders. Florida law actually says that the commission starts looking at those offenders 180 days prior to their release. You know, I'm here to tell you that looking at an offender 180 days prior to their release, offenders who've been designated as being the most violent offenders who um, have a prior incarceration, whether it's state or federal, but 180 days is insufficient to start changing behaviors. You really need to get in there earlier. And that was one of the things that we did at the commission was we tried, although the law didn't provide for it, we were trying to be innovative, realizing that we had a recidivism issue with this population of offenders. We actually had conversations with the Department of Corrections. They allowed us to do a pilot project at the Gadsden uh, Reentry Center and we would start going in with our team of interviewers 
and try to identify the issues that were really going to be a, a major hurdle for these offenders to get over once they were released. But we were able to get in there 24 months to 36 months prior to their release. This is no longer in place, you know, as um, governors change, as chairwomen change or chairmen change, you know, policies change. And so while we had success with that, we absolutely got the attention of the offenders and they started participating in programs and they were able to succeed on the outside. I, I still think that the law needs to be changed in the Senate time making this comment in front of you, the law needs to be changed to allow the commission to review those cases prior to 180 days. And again, that's just an insufficient time to affect behaviors for violent offenders. So we had those programs, and I, th I think one of the things that I'm so thankful about um, today is I just really applaud the Florida Bar for having this summit where we can actually sit here talk about some of these issues with individuals that have experience trying to administer these programs or being part of the programs themselves before a crisis occurs, you know, because um, so many times, you know, what do they call those legislative responses to crisis, the knee-jerk reactions, sometimes policies are passed, you know, no offense. Um, I, res I resent that. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes policies are, a p are passed that we find out after the fact really wasn't the best um, result for what we were experiencing, that there might have been a better way to address it. And I mean, I certainly give the legislature credit for taking these tough issues on. They're not always easy to address. But what you can end up with is what I just described to you. You have a discretionary release program and then you have a mandatory release program where offenders are absolutely coming out whether or not they have prepared themselves for release. Many times they will purposely <coughs> violate the rules inside the institution so they don't have to come out with a longer period of supervision or they won't participate in the programming. And so then they're back out in society and we have the problems that we, we have. Certainly we can address those through um, violation reports of the behaviors. There's been a lot of talk about technical violations and a concern that maybe uh, releasing authorities are too tough on technical violators. And that can be the fact, you know, just depending on philosophies and perceptions and again, some of the things that we talked about at lunch. But what you should know about the technical violators are it's not just being late for a curfew or missing a program. It can be someone having contact with a victim that was told not to have contact with a victim. It can be someone who has left the county of jurisdiction or fled the state. You know, they're not making themselves available for supervision. And so I think what's important to know is that releasing authorities have the responsibility to look at the matter as a whole and try to come up with a solution that will ensure sure successful uh, reintegration into society because that's what we want right we do not want them reoffending we do not want to have further victims I can say that you know in addition to that pilot project that we did with uh, the Department of Corrections we were also you know with the technical violators very interested in not returning all of them although we had a, a department or a commission policy <coughs> that these violators would not be entitled to have a bond. We did try to go in and make sure that we were looking very carefully at those cases and not holding someone if it was just a curfew violation or something like that. We didn't want anyone to lose their jobs, lose their homes, or have their families disrupted because of something that really, again, wasn't, um, you know, a, a new crime. And that's what we were trying to avoid. There have been so many good things that we have seen in our state, and um, it really requires innovative thinking. One of the things that I think has been most beneficial to some of the parolees that we have released is we had a crime prevention panel. It consisted of three violent offenders who had been paroled. They were also juveniles at the time that they were arrested and convicted and they had served 35 to 40 years of their sentence. They had actually been paroled before I got to the commission. But we had these individuals and we had a victim of a violent crime 
who served on a panel and they traveled with us to various parts of the state and they spoke to at-risk youth about peer pressure, about what it was like being in prison, about lessons that they had learned and things that they could avoid. And the kids were incredibly receptive to listening to these individuals. And what was really neat is you had a victim of a violent crime standing up there with three individuals that were convicted of very violent crimes, whether it was a homicide or even a, a sex battery. And they became like brothers and sister. I mean, it was, they truly looked out for each other and had a great relationship. And, and again, the youth were very receptive to it. So we're gonna, are you back are we running, sorry, Well, yes. I could go Just on all I, day. I there are so that. many things, but yes, so go ahead. Have, have Senator Rusan speak, because we do want to do some interaction sure. and have time for questions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. And uh, when you go last, much has been said. I do want to thank uh, my strongest ally in the Florida Senate on criminal justice reform, who just walked into the room, Senator Jeff Brandis. Jeff, thank you. We are not just judges. We are not just lawyers. We are leaders. We are people who are expected to be creative in interpreting the law and in its application. You've heard each of the speakers previously talk about what brought them into this room, what brought them into this area of reentry. Well, how many of us wake up every day and say, I am truly walking in my passion. I am truly walking in my destiny and in my purpose. And that's what I believe I am. Uh, 20 years, seven months ago today, I woke up at Hazelden in West Palm Beach trying to figure out how to quit smoking crack, drinking alcohol, and smoking cigarettes. I spent nine years in eight different drug treatment programs. And when I moved back to St. Petersburg, no car, no driver's license. Illinois had taken it for a five-year revocation because of two DUIs. No job, no, no one to believe in me but my four-year-old son sleeping on the floor at 535 Central Avenue, downtown St. Pete, washing off in the public bathrooms of that building before people came to work. In fact, Judge Pam Campbell, before she became a judge, her office was on that floor. And she used to tease me. She'd say, boy, you're working hard. I saw you here last night before I left, and you're here early this morning. <laughs> but it was a year later that I was only able to tell her that I was actually homeless, and nobody would hire me. When they asked me, where have you been for the last nine years, and I told them in drug treatment programs, they patted me on the back and said, someone will hire you, just not us. But Susan Sharuti, the county attorney, gave me an opportunity to get my feet wet. That's why employment is so important in second chances for people. She hired me at $17.50 an hour as a law clerk in the county attorney's office on a four-month contract. That's how I began to build my life again, through a community that was supportive, through people that were understanding, through opportunities that were given me. And that's what reentry is all about. It's not just a public, it's not just a humanitarian issue, it's a public safety issue. It's a community health issue. And when we give people opportunities to get their self-respect back, which is why Amendment 4 is so important, when you've paid your debt, done your time, certainly we should welcome you back into society and into the social structure. So I walked into this thing when I became president of the NAACP. It was affirmed. I would run into guys on street corners. I'd say, didn't you just get out of jail? and you're back out here selling crack again, they would say, well, look, I can't find work. And if I can't find work, I'm gonna sell dope. 
because I need to raise my family. I need to do this. I need to pay bills. I need to re-enter. I need to and it became a mission for me at the NAACP. And then I ran for the State House and was fortunate to be ranking Democrat on Justice Appropriations Committee for six years, overseeing Department of Corrections, Department of Juvenile Justice, all the state attorneys, the public defenders, the, uh, the justice area of the budget, and able to work on reentry programs from a personal passion. And it's important. And Chair Pate, I still call you Chair Pate of the Parole Commission, you're being, being modest. It was the smallest agency of government with the smallest budget, but the greatest impact on people. Because those who were trying to get pardons, those who were trying to get clemencies, those who were trying to restore their rights so that they can restore self-respect was important. And I fought hard for that agency. Brought them 85,000 one year that helped with the decreasing the backlog of people. 300,000. Well, that was the second year. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's the number I remember. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be answering questions if you have it. But uh, reentry is critical, it's important, and we all need to be leaders in this area. If you could. I would like you to both address just one, um, what you think is one of the most important practical barriers to reentry, and what are what is one of the biggest policy barriers to reentry? So the number one operational problem is I-9 readiness, absolutely. So all of us who have worked or have a job, right, we all filled out 9-9. And I know when I filled mine out, I had a passport, which was the only document I needed. Uh, most of our population has no passport, so they need a whole suite of documents. You need a birth certificate, you may need a social security card, and typically you do need a social security card if you're going to get a state-issued ID. Uh, the Florida Department of Corrections uh, has some programs to do this, right? They have a flow van, they call it. They drive the van onto the prison to print out your ID. The problem is you have to have those other pieces of ID. Further complicating matters in your state is uh, the fact that roughly, well, there are estimates of about 50% of your releases were not born in the state of Florida. So there's no possibility of you getting an out-of-state birth certificate. Now, we had this problem in New Jersey. I know everyone in this room probably thinks New Jersey is one of the greatest states in the entire country, and why? How, how could anyone who was ever born you know, uh, in New Jersey leave? Um, but actually, we're a very transient community. Um, must be all of our fine pollution. But in any event, um, we had that problem in New Jersey. And to be honest, when I was running the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, I, I, I got tired of the excuses, and I said, you know what? I have an army of lawyers, so lawyers can get birth certificates from anywhere. I really don't want to hear anything else about this debate. And then we went and got birth certificates from 40-something states and Belize and all these other places, right? So I-9 readiness is number one, because even if you have somebody that wants to hire you, you can't get there. Sitting right behind that, the policy piece, is fines and fees, right? Uh, these things are ransoms for most of the population. And the problem is, in places like New Jersey, uh, they bond against the debt. So you know you're not collecting most of that debt anyway, uh, but they'll bond against it. In Texas, they fund the hospital system. So try making that political argument that we should just forgive fines and fees for people who have uh, criminal records when that's gonna fund the hospital system. So um, that's the biggest policy problem we have. I was explaining this issue to Governor Bryant in Mississippi. Uh, who really gets this stuff. And uh, we were, it was right before he signed a bill, and I was talking to him about it, about stopping these debtors' prisons surrounding fines and fees. And I said, Governor, if you're sending a cop or a sheriff to go get somebody for a $200 ticket, you've already lost more money by the time the cop drove him to the county jail. The cop has to find him or encounter him or her, has to drive him to the county jail, has to process him, someone in the DOC has to you give him a strip search and a, and, a, and a meal and a cell and a tan uniform or orange, depending on where you are. So I said, Governor, that's the worst deal that I could think of. I said, you lost more money 
just by that. I said, if you did something to create tax bases out of these people, I said, you not only will increase your public safety outcomes, but you'll also actually increase your fiscal outcomes as well. So those would be my two. Very good. Thank you. Well, in, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around the country and in our state about uh, ban the box. And, but what a lot of people are now, I think, also beginning to understand in Florida that we have uh, estimates somewhere between 700 and 1,000 employment opportunities that are prohibited because of the fact that you can't get the, the certification that you need licensing from the state of Florida. And so we need some help, obviously, that in, in a huge way with the barriers that are precluding us now on, on employment. The other thing that um, to me was very obvious in one of the meetings, uh, one of the breakout sessions this morning um, was the fact that our state has got to make the decision that we're going to have the will to invest in the infrastructure that we need to have for folks coming home. There was a great discussion this morning around mental health, um, but we've been having this discussion now for 20 years on a lot of these issues. And uh, the providers that are critical, the work that we do in reentry, it, it's a village approach. It, it requires a lot of important partners there, but most of the partners we have struggle every day. A lot of people want to say that the nonprofit community and the partners don't work well together and they're battling each other. Well, they're Folks are throwing out crumbs, and there has to be that battle, and there shouldn't be. Um, and so I hope, I hope that we're going to be able to uh, provide the resources. And the other thing is that we, quite frankly, need reentry all over the state. Um, yeah. We know it works. We've said that. And so every person coming home deserves the opportunity to have a pathway pay for them. And so once again, it's a resource issue, and I hope our state is going to be willing to want to make that investment. Thank you. Well, certainly agree with what uh, both um, these gentlemen have said. Uh, you know, employment is the toughest piece. Employment is the toughest piece. Number one, will you get the job if you're an unconvicted felon? And number two, once you get the job, do you have the training, do you have the thinking process um, so that you will keep the job? In other words, so there won't be anger management issues. So there won't be, you know, and, and you, you sometimes have to work with people and say, okay, this isn't a job for you in a group setting where you're working closely with a lot of people. You need to be the delivery person. You know, you need to be on your own. Um, policy changes, um, I just would agree with what has been said here, but um, it's, it's the external piece, getting somebody to hire, and then it's the internal piece, giving these individuals the right counseling and um, uh, cognitive behavioral skills to keep the job, assuming they can cross that barrier. So I agree that it's employment, which also impacts housing, homelessness, et cetera. And that's a huge indicator for future criminal behavior and um, the prevention of someone successfully reentering society. As far as policy, I think that we need to have a commitment from the state that we are absolutely committed to reentry and we're going to prepare these offenders for reentry prior to their release. And then the use of the transition and reentry programs on the outside to carry it for a time certain till they get back into the communities. I agree with what's been said. I would put emphasis on employment, affordable housing, and transportation. As one of seven senators in the Tampa Bay area, I'm the only one that has both sides of the bridge. I represent both downtown Tampa and downtown St. Petersburg with a little bit of water in between. Um, I'm watching gentrification. I'm watching condos, lofts, and towers going up in both of these downtowns, jobs that people can't get to because of lack of transportation. But affordable housing, it, I mean, I can't afford the one-bedroom apartments that they're building now um, for people in uh, employment, affordable housing, and transportation. Great, thank you. Thanks. We have a few minutes for questions of this panel. Anybody questions? Yes, sir. Uh, where's Buddha with the mic? Here there I am. He is. Putting aside um, Ava DuVernay's uh, depiction of the prison system in 13, have any of you seen that documentary by any chance? Yes. Not everyone. Let me recommend it to you, but she talks about the 
uh, prison industry business. Um, and my question is, why is there not a greater connect uh, between the needs of employers uh, during the time that if we're going to work prisoners, why are we not working them and training them in ways that are going to maximize the likelihood of their finding employment? We've got a captive audience. And I found this to be true with respect to juveniles when we were housing them in our jail and they had been previously delinquent from school. We created a school that came to class and looked forward to learning. So my point is we're housing people for lengths of time in which we have the opportunity to train them effectively. And I know uh, Mr. Gay is doing some of this in Jacksonville, but what is the impediment within the system to using that time in ways that will facilitate the objective of, of employment since it is such a critical element in rehabilitation? Well, Your Honor, you know, part of what, as we all think most of us know, is that you know, 25 years ago, the state swept most of the funding that you know community colleges were actually responsible for doing the vocational training inside our prisons. You go to Baker, which is the real feeder of prison for Jacksonville, and you've got big rooms that have you know facilities that were teed up initially. Um, I am excited about the fact now that you know over the last I guess four years, five years now in Jacksonville with our community uh, colleges and our uh, University of North Florida, we've developed vocational training. We took these nine-month, year-long programs and put them into 40-hour certification, really more post-release. But now we finally got um, Julie Jones, Secretary, this willing to begin to look at taking this program and this training inside. And it had to come from us bringing resources there, of course, as opposed to the resources being on the inside. But we've got uh, some fund funders and donors for coding that we're going to be introducing into Baker here this next year. Another programming that we know that's going to be viable and there's a strong absorption rate coming out. And so, but you're right, you've got an absolute captive audience that's there that's hungry. We started last year taking employers into the prison at Baker to tell the story that we need you and want you, just so that folks would start wanting to learn and, you know, of course be teed up. But you're right, until such time. and. These are the battles that, you know, that Senator Roussan and others are fighting, and that's where I think the next step needs to come. Yeah, I think it's happening slowly. Julie Jones has been a breath of fresh air when it comes to that. But some of the things I've heard is when the economy was bad and jobs were scarce, you don't want to train people in prison to come out and compete for jobs for those who didn't commit a crime and go to prison. And, I mean, I heard that being talked about. Then the other thing was, well, they're here for punishment. They're not here for training. They're not here to be certified in a job when they come. They're here for punishment. And that's when we cut uh, the prison budgets, uh, those kinds of things. But I think the pendulum is swinging back now. Other questions? So I, I yes. The male population. Um, currently, right now, we've got some serious issues uh, going on at Lowell, and the women in the prison system. Are there? Do you know of any other uh, particular sort of initiatives that are addressing the women in prison issues? So, I mean, you know, nationally, there's been a real push, right? For those of you who don't know, uh, women are the, that, that population skyrocketing, um, and there are what we'll call conditions abuses, right, from, from uh, women's health issues that are just being neglected in the prisons. Uh, we have issues of, of abuse. Um, but I think there's a turn towards, you know, mommy and me programs uh, on things to make, to, to connect folks, uh, to connect women's specific issues. Um, candidly, I think that the women's population has been growing for a few years now. Um, I think we're going to continue to see probably more resources pushed into male prisons because, well, it's men committing most of the crimes. I think I can say that and not be accused of implicit bias, right, after what we learned. But, you know, looking at the numbers, that's where it's at. Um, but I think that we're starting to see things al along the way. And, you know, the key piece, I think, is, is the family reunification piece when you're talking about women who are locked up. Um, you know, they're... You know, when you go to a when you go to a, a visit in a male prison, 
you know, there's almost always a woman there. Sometimes two, actually. I saw some fights break out when I was locked up that two girlfriends came to visit the same guy on the same day. But in the women's prison, it's just not the same. It might be a grandmother, a mother, right? And these are, these are single moms before they went in, and then they're completely separated moms when they go in. So it's an issue that I think some states are tackling. California probably better than most, but I think, uh, I think Florida has uh, some ways to go there. But I think a lot of it, it, we hear a lot about funding in Florida, right? Because uh, there was the issue with your uh, medical provider here in Florida. And because you're constitutionally obligated to provide medical care, so much of your resources went there uh, and then couldn't go to viable reentry programs across genders or races or anything like that. So I think that's, that's something y'all have to really fix, um, in my opinion, is that medical piece. Uh, there's no reason why a prison medical provider should be exempt from value-based care principles. Uh, we, put, we put together an MCO model in New Jersey like that. Yeah, I was just going to say he's right on that medical piece. As a result of that, Department of Corrections cut by 40% across the board uh, treatment-based beds in the community. Um, we've got to find a way to fully fund both. So I would just follow up with saying, and I think that this panel in many ways um, demonstrates it, and that is the communities are really willing to help. Because what we know is our community social service providers are providing these services, right, at one time or another. The hospitals are treating these folks in the emergency rooms when they're released. The um, homeless centers are housing them when they're released, when we're not caring for them beforehand so that they're supplied. Um, so w what I've seen, and I'd, I'd be curious about this in terms of yours, is to me part of the problem is access. And I know you were talking about finally being allowed into Baker. And we have community service providers who would be more than happy to set up mentoring programs, to do vocational training, all of that, but they're not allowed inside the walls. And so to the extent to which the department is able to control the walls and prevent that, you know, I'm just interested in if there's, if, if you have seen that and if you believe there are some solutions to that, because that's been painful to me in Palm Beach well, that's County. A, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago, maybe gosh, seven or eight years ago, uh, when Senator, uh, or excuse me, um, Walt McNeil was the secretary. We did something really unique, and Tina, you, I think you were involved in this, but we converted a couple of our prisons into reentry facilities. It was mainly because of the challenge we see all over the country. As a matter of fact, I think strategically we have put prisons way away from where cities are and it's tough for our families to stay connected. But what we found in our world and the work that we've been doing in reentry, it was absolutely incredible logistically to get your team into one of 140 facilities around the state of Florida. And so what we did is we, we converted Baker Prison into a reentry facility so men about a year out from their sentence are located at one facility and then Lowell that was brought up earlier for the women and so what we have every week now in Baker are all of our partners our team as well as our community partners are at Baker for all the men that are going to be coming back to the same community and it's the most logical approach I think Polk is the other we have one that feeds into into Tampa and there could be one up in the panhandle by Tallahassee but I believe Everything that we've seen over the last seven, six, seven years, it's been incredible to get those resources more embedded into the facilities uh, than before. So, Senator, I, that's something that I, I, maybe we can even revisit around the state. Families are getting connected because they're closer. Um, our community partners are developing the relationship. There's branding that's taking place between the, the, you know, those that are incarcerated with the community that's going in. And so it's a great point. We need and, to do more of it. And with that great point, I think we're going to have to finish up for the final gathering um, in, back up in Hillsborough. But I really want to thank this wonderful panel. You have great experience. You've contributed so much to this issue. And I uh, just thank you for being here and sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.